Hey, what's up, everybody? You're listening to Cannabis Karaoke, where we ask you to grab the mic and tell your story. Get inside info from today's most interesting cannabis pioneers, and from the first note to the end of the song, listen up as you get to hear the stories of success on Cannabis Karaoke. All right, we're back with another episode of Cannabis Karaoke, and uh, we have a, a really amazing guest on the show today. Um, she's done a lot in the space for business to business connection and just overall a voice and kind of wears her heart on her sleeve and lets everybody know how it's going with her. Um, I'd like to welcome Adelia Carrillo to the show. Thanks, Danny, for having me. I'm excited to be here. <laughs> Absolutely. I, you know, I don't know who's more excited cause I, like I, like I kind of introduced you. I've always felt like when I was following you on social media or when we would run into each other, like most people try to kind of protect themselves as far as like everything's great or everything's sunny or, you know, you're, you're kind of a rare one in the sense that you just come out and tell it how it is. And you know, you're, you've just always been such a straight shooter from the beginning. So part of this is like why cannabis and how cannabis interacts in your life. But I'm super enthralled with that part of you. So can you tell me like how cannabis kind of led you to where you're at right now? And then, Talk to me a little bit on the backside of that around, and I can remind you how you kind of have dealt with the space. Yeah, yeah. Um, so my background, I came from the consumer electronics industry. Um, you know, to be honest, I thought that was going to be my my career, where I was going to literally uh, just focus and, and build a voice um, and, and, as I mentioned, a career. Um, however, things kind of transformed in my personal life. Um, I ended up having some health complications, um, which led down a pretty serious road. And uh, I turned to cannabis as a as a last resort. Um, And honestly, you know, I like cannabis changed me. I I look at back at to who I was beforehand. And I like I've done a 180 in the human being that I am. Um, but throughout that experience, when I became a medical cannabis patient, I started researching, uh, but more specifically researching on things that I like, which is, you know, tech startup entrepreneurship. And at the time I, I couldn't resonate with what was out there. And I saw a big need for, you know, an ecosystem catering to cannabis entrepreneurs and startups. And that was kind of how that idea evolved for, for DCN, um, we we launched in 2015, um, and that's what led the path to to creating uh, what now is a, a leading digital business to business news network. Um, DCN gives a voice to the latest tech entrepreneurs and innovative companies in the cannabis industry. Um, and throughout that journey, it you know being around startups and entrepreneurs uh, for a long time, even before DCN, I saw that. I don't want to say it's it's a uh, it's fake. It's it's more of a face that we we feel we have to put on out front. You know, whether it's to investors or to even potential clients or our colleagues, because you don't ever want to seem like your company's not doing good. That could affect you in so many ways. You know, if you're real to an investor, maybe they won't invest in you. If you're real to a potential client, maybe they won't buy that service that you're offering. So I I, I get why people have to kind of present themselves in a certain way, but I didn't, you know, I, I've kind of been one of those people that I, I've always held my emotions in for so long in my life and it's never been good for me. And so I did not I wanted to actually just kind of be out and open for this journey as a whole and just remind people that you're not alone, that we're all dealing with all these heavy burdens of, you know, trying to um, follow this passion and, and building this startup where at times many people may not even believe in what you're doing. So you have to kind of push yourself and motivate yourself on that, on that road. So that's really what led to that, that being real and, and sharing even the good or even the bad on the journey, uh, not just the good. <laughs> so was, <clears throat> is that therapeutic in a way? Because I noticed when you would post stuff, look, girl, you would hit me like square. And I was like, Oh my God, it's exactly what I'm going through right now. And we've had a number of phone calls between us, you know, kind of, I don't want to say talking anything off the ledge, but just like, is this happening to you as well? Because coming from a business background, cannabis is so different. What, 
why do you think it's so much harder in the cannabis space and how did you kind of being forthright with the way you were handling things, how do you feel like those two combined? Um, you know, I think within the cannabis space, it's just so noisy. Uh, the biggest lesson I learned about a year and a half ago was, you know, I was, I was listening to the noise and not focusing on my business. And I think that's what a lot of people are, are having trouble uh, dealing with is, you know, and, and you kind of mentioned it too on one of our previous calls is, you know, being very careful on how many events you're going to and, you know, and speaking opportunities. And, um, you know, I think that's the pressure is we feel we have to be everywhere, but in reality, no, you know, the, the cannabis industry is still in its infancy of building blocks of becoming an industry. And right now our main thing as founders is to focus on your business. You know, it's, it's not necessarily going to every single conference throughout the year um, or speaking at every opportunity you get. It really needs to go back to what your main focus is, which is the company and your mission. Um, what was the second part? <laughs> well, that, how did like why is it why is it? So I kind of have I mean, you've pretty much described every single cannabis issue i feel that you know we did talk about how do you make a decision to what events to go to and you know i guess the question was why is why in cannabis is it so hard to make that decision is it fomo is it just that you don't know who you're going to meet because like at a certain point you've met as many people as you can maintain Mm -hmm. but why what about cannabis makes this is it just the opportunity the hyperness of it all that's a good question. I think it has to do with a little bit of FOMO. I think it has to do a little bit with because this industry is changing every single day, that adds to that stress of not knowing, you know, so maybe there's a speaker that is a part of, you know, um, a certain cal- a certain state government or you never know, just you never know what, what may be taught or said at an event or at a certain um gathering that you're not a part of that that could be why you're missing out which i guess goes with fomo um, but i think <laughs> it is just trying to stay up to beat with all the different changes that are happening every single day in the space uh I, i'm not too sure you know i think yeah that is a good question i don't know but hopefully i think at the end of the day if we can all be more in tune with um kind of taking a step back, slowing things down and focusing again on that mission of why and what you're doing, it'll long-term benefit your vision and company. I feel too that sometimes in this space, because people hit walls pretty quickly and then they try to pivot around it. I think that there's just, there's so many shiny objects that people try to and that's something I have to give you credit for because you stayed, ex- you are extremely focused when it comes to executing your business model. How was it hard? How was it hard for you to to stay focused um, in a in an industry too that didn't necessarily understand where it was at when you started? Because you've you've been in the game for a minute, and the the I, like, there's almost like a timeline of change of evolution, if you will, of cannabis, like had we both started now, well, we wouldn't know anything, but on top Mm -hmm. of that, we wouldn't have to go through all the, we went through a lot. You went through a lot of confusion in the very beginning. How, how did you address that? And how did you keep yourself on like what they say are your MBOs, your major business objectives? Like what, what, and then how, again, I want to pull in like at the end of your day, how did you, Medicaid, what was your choice for cannabis? Like what, like, do you smoke weed? I mean, I'm sorry, do you smoke flour? Do you smoke a joint? Do you vape? Do you dab? Um, Do you remember? Okay. (laughs) Cool. So first things first, I love joints. I'm I'm a joint kind of girl. Um, I don't know. It's just my thing. I I prefer that. Uh, I do have a couple of my favorite bongs, of course. And I most recently, about a year ago, started started dabbing but it's it's more when i'm like either having like either really exhausted and i can't sleep or if my body is going through a lot of physical pain uh to help with that um the other thing is i don't i'm like type a and and always working so i'm not one of those um i can't consume during the day not that i don't want to it's just that when i do like honestly i just become way too chill and i just want to like hang out and so i can't be my productive self or i think too much and i'm like i don't want to mess up a business call i don't you know i'm very 
to the T on, on making sure everything's getting done. So, um, but yeah, going back to that, I'm a joint tech person. Um, going into the, you know, kind of the inception and everything with DCN and, and to, when we first launched, we launched a pilot. We were really, un, we weren't sure of how this was going to be, to be honest. Um, you know, coming from kind of a corporate background, I didn't know if we were going to be too business. And, you know, I remember going to one of these first events back in the day and, it, oh, I forget the name. It was a, it was more sesh like, but those are all entrepreneurs. They're all building brands. They're all business owners. So that's why we were there. We, and we we're walking around with the camera and like a microphone, and we're like ready to go and putting the microphone in all their faces. And a lot of them were like, "Whoa, hold on, who are you? What's going on?" Like it was just they were taken aback by it. But the reality was, you know, they are entrepreneurs. You know, it, it, at the end of the day, even in you know, back in the day, the black market, the gray market, they were business owners and some of them got it and, and you know, were really good at describing what their business was. Um, other people weren't ready for it at the time. Um, but it, looking back, we were confused. We were almost, we were like a B2B slash B2C media company on the outside, even though like our whole mission was entrepreneurs uh, and B2B. Um, so it was a learning learning curve definitely uh and actually i don't really you know it was all a part of the process we had to learn we had to get our feet wet to really see what was needed um and then after that year of being out there we regrouped we actually rebranded our look we got our voice a lot clearer um and then we officially launched dcn so that pilot mode of what we did was very key uh, and it helped evolve our identity a lot better um, to once we officially launched DCN. When you, <clears throat> what led you to wanting to be that B2B solution, you know, when it came to providing support for brands? Because if you don't follow the Direct Cannabis Network, um, there is, you know, a lot of resources that come with being in your scope. Like, what motivated you to do that? Um, there was two things, you know, one, I saw the missing need of a voice for cannabis entrepreneurship, but the second thing was, you know, I saw how cannabis changed me, how it affected, you know, who I was as a, as a human being, but I also resonated with these, you know, these growers, these, these generation of families who have been sacrificing and, and taking a risk for this plant for so long that I wanted to make sure that we didn't forget the why I knew this was going to become something that was, you know, a transition into a huge industry that was going to become global. And I also knew money would come in and it would have a it would start to change some of the way things were and, and the ethics and the building blocks of, a, of the foundation. So it was really wanting to build a voice of the why and making sure we don't forget why people have risked their lives for this plant, why people are moving their families to another state to help, you know, their children or family members uh, to get this plant into their hands. Um, and just, you know, why people are leaving their careers and, and just risking it all to, to build a business in, in something that was, and still is considered a high risk industry. Um, that's really the heart of it is, is, you know, making sure we don't lose that. Why? Yeah. Giving a voice and really understanding, keeping it got so cliche, but like trying to keep it real to a certain point. Yeah. Um, you know, there is, a, you, you touched on some, a couple really hot topics right now. It's flying around the internet quite a bit with uh, the fact that all these big companies now are, have jumped in and they're making a ton of money and um, there's still people doing hard time for the plant. Uh, mm -hmm. How how do you, like being a storyteller platform, which is what we are, supporting the storytellers like yourself, what's your viewpoint on, on that and how guilty do, should we feel about you know look i've been in the game for a minute and like even before starting what i've been involved with and there's times when i broke the law to the point where i could have probably gone to jail how do we help those people how do we help the pioneers that truly are serving time for literally a non-violent offense and just possession of the plant you know, I think it's continuing to educate the reality that's happening. Um, you know, a lot of people are coming into this space and they may not have 
They may not be as knowledgeable um, on the history of the plant and, and the reality uh, of what's still out there, especially in California, man, we're in a bubble. <laughs> right. You know, yes, we have a lot of still hurdles and regulations and all that, but we are in a bubble when you look at other states and, and what's going on. Um, so the biggest thing is education. The biggest thing is everybody, whether they're patients, advocates, or business owners, is to continue like I said, educating on that fact and finding organizations they can help, um, you know, to to make sure that that's being thought about, that people are still going after these initiatives to get these people out of jail. Like, it's, it's not right. Um, you know, with DCN, um, I, at the time, I didn't have the funds, you know, but I had a voice and I was able to, to show it in that way. So as many times as I could, I would communicate that in, you know, our newsletters or in content, or even when I was speaking on other um, platforms is just adding that little bit of extra reminder and, and education on that aspect. Um, you know, hopefully now with where things go in the future, which I'm sure we'll talk about that in a little bit, um, you know, I'll have more time to really be able to bring even more awareness to that because that is a big thing. You know, it's not right for everybody to be, for all of us to be making money off of this plant while somebody's in jail. It, it's, it's not. It is something that impacts me and I'm trying to figure out what voice to amplify um, mm -hmm. because it's not, there are, you know, cannabis space is hugely supporting, you know, uh, cannabis for seizures and children and all the whole spectrum. I mean, I'm not going to run them all down, but like oftentimes the incarcerated people are not on that list of top of mind when we're talking about it. And it is a little sacrilegious to be profiting off, off a space while there's still people, you know, I'd love to see an organization launch that funded or help fund, you know, legal representation for some of these people to see if maybe, you know, we can make an impact on that. That would be something that we, we could work on together. Since you, you talked about the future a little bit, why don't you tell us a little bit about the transition that you're going through? Uh, and, you know, because cannabis has impacted your life, why you're choosing to stay in the cannabis space? Yeah, so um, it's been a crazy um, few years. It's been an even crazier few months. Um, you know, I am very... I try to be as transparent as transparent as I can be with this journey. And um, most recently, I finally realized that I no longer have the passion to continue to build or, or lead a direct cannabis network. Um, not that I don't believe in the mission or the, the ecosystem or everything that has been evolved around it, but just me personally, like I don't, I can't continue to move it forward. We've had a lot of startup hurdles uh, along the way. And, you know, as we started to transition this year, you know, this year I really was like, this is going to be my last year of if I can make DCN survive. And I had a strategic plan. Everything was going into place. It was moving in the right direction. But I finally had this realization that I'm not giving 110%. And how can I, as a leader, lead people if I'm not fully in? And it was the hardest thing to realize, um, but when it finally kind of came into reality and then I first said it out loud and I literally, after it came out of my mouth, just felt a weight off my shoulders, I knew that this was it. You know, th this, my, my decision has been made. Um, but within that announcement, we are going through something I never thought we would go through and, and experience, and this will be my first time going through it. Um, but we are in, we've got quite a few offers to go through a, a brand acquisition, which means DCN's voice potentially could move forward and the ecosystem could still continue to grow. Um, you know, I think, I know DCN is needed. I know that there needs to be a voice for cannabis entrepreneurs and startups. And, you know, if we, if things go in the right direction, um, hopefully that will still be met. Um, but with that, you know, I, I looked at, you know, going back into the consumer electronic industry for a short minute, it was a thought, but the reality is I'm here. I want to be a part of this community. I want to be a part of this industry. I feel I can still make a difference. Um, and you know, wherever that leads me, I'm, I'm open. Um, 
Right now, where it leads me is to a, another uh, cannabis company. It's a cannabis tech company uh, called Event High, which is an online ticketing platform for cannabis-related events. Um, so they have an online technology that helps event organizers sell tickets and sponsorships. And, you know, it's still kind of looking at the two companies, it, it still allows me to help and, and build a voice and connect the community and industry together. Um, this time, though, through events and experiences um, as we provide the technology to event organizers. So I'm, I'm actually really excited about this one. Yeah, and you bring us just a small book of business to them as well. Um, the, all the people that you've ever interacted with, you know, obviously yeah. <laughs> are prime candidates. I saw their that company pop up not too long ago, um, and and I'm very happy about that because people have had their events uh, shut down by the other online ticketing uh, companies. They just don't want to participate. So it's a perfect solution to a perfect problem in our niche. And uh, I'm glad to see that you got you ended up. I kind of had a feeling that that would be before we. I even found out. I was like, man, she'd be such a huge asset for those people <laughs> if they recognize it. I want to go back to DCN a little bit um, and what being an entrepreneur means. I, I had a conversation. I've had a couple conversations with people, and a lot of times people kind of try to measure entrepreneurship based on success. That's automatic, right? Like, well, I'm not an entrepreneur if I'm not successful. In reality, you're an entrepreneur and when you learn to make the decisions that you made around leaving a company that you founded. Tell I want people to understand that part because I think it's such a, a, a like valuable part of the learning process of knowing when to say when, but still having the desire to see that that baby live on, if you will. So tell us a little bit about those feelings, I guess, if you if depending on how deep you want to get that came with making that decision because it's both enlightening and relieving while at the same time you're a little bit, you know, disappointed possibly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, there were, and there still are a lot of different emotions that, that comes with this, um, you know, in, in a variety of ways, uh, like DCN initially, like I said, came, uh, through kind of a health traumatic situation I was going through and you know I in a sense I saw it almost um, like as most founders do I'm sure as their baby you know it, it's something that they give their all in uh, and I've dedicated many years on this company um, but the one thing I have you know learned along the way from speaking with other founders from successful founders to founders who have uh, stopped their companies or the, the companies have um, been acquired or whatever that it is I've, I've just tried to really learn as much as I can consume as much information as I can to make sure that I can strategically move forward within the company I was building however that knowledge also then helps the audience that we're connecting to uh, and the one thing that I always remembered is you know um, the the you need to make sure you're still you're always connected with your why and and that your passion is always you, that you're, you still have the passion within you to continue moving forward with the company. You know, uh, when, when investors acquire a company and they kick out the founder, that company usually fails. And it's because that why and that passion is no longer leading the company. You know, that it's a very high uh, uh, statistic rate of that happening. Um, so that I think is very important to recognize that if you are a building your company and that fire or that flame is no longer lit, it isn't right to move forward. Um, but going more into back into the emotions, um, I honestly don't know how, I, I am shocked to see that I, I was able to recognize it on my own. Um, I think it was more on looking at the reality. Uh, the past couple months, my anxiety has started to increase. Uh, I started getting hits of depression. Um, I started having waves of self-doubt, which I thought the self-doubt was just, you know, that was what it was. It was just self-doubt trying to stop me because things were moving forward in the right direction. But then as my body started to like kind of give me these warning signs of, hey, you're not okay, you know, what's going on? You're, um, I, I had to really tune in to, to what was happening. Um, as I mentioned before, I wasn't, I wasn't really like this when it comes to speaking on my, my 
feelings or what I'm going through as a, as a child, as an adult, uh, until cannabis. So I think the reality with cannabis is that, that it makes you self-aware if you allow it to. It really allows you to connect with you if you look at it that way. You know, it's not just about, um, you know, just smoking or consuming cannabis just to kind of just chill. Like it really can connect you to yourself in a more deeper way and, and on so many levels. And I think that is what allowed me to get to where I'm at is, is having that connection with myself, is being more aware, uh, is um, just reflecting on everything that I'm doing. Um, so I don't know if that's, you know, if I answered the question exactly, but that's kind of how I felt it, it come into Sue is, is, is that cannabis helped it and, and just being more aware of my emotions. Well, <clears throat> there's no right or wrong answer when it's your feelings, <laughs> you know, and, and I, I remember I, I reached out right when I saw you post that and I was like, okay, but I want to see, you know, kind of where she's at and you were super level headed and no real, there wasn't any sense of mourning, right? Like, Oh my gosh, I've completely failed. You're just like, I gave it everything I had. I just wasn't, I'm not feeling it anymore. I don't <laughs> think I can pull, I don't want to disappoint people. So rather than, than do that, I'm going to kick out. And, yeah. and you did have, you know, opportunity approach you after that. Walk us through a little bit. Cause you are a serial entrepreneur, whether you realize it or not, but I want you to tell us like, how did that feel? Like, here you go. You put your scepter down, quote unquote, and you get ready to walk away and someone's like, excuse me, <laughs> what are you doing with that scepter right there? I'd like to talk to you about it. Tell us a little bit about that and like how that felt like when you were ready to come to terms and then that, that happened. What does that feel like? It was, it, it still is. It's, it's amazing. It's amazing because, you know, to know that what my team and I were able to do and, and everybody, you know, all the contributors that were a part of DCN, what we were all able to do is something somebody wants, you know, and they want to see it to move forward. Like, I think that is just an amazing feeling. Like, you know, looking back at closing a company, it isn't a failure in general. You know, you have to look back at everything you've learned, everything you've accomplished. But for, for me, where I'm at now to see that, all those hurdles and up and downs that I could only see because when you're building a company, that's really all you focus on. You're not, especially in the beginning phases, a couple of years, you're so distracted by surviving and, and making sure you're, you're meeting your next milestone or, um, you know, or whatnot that you don't necessarily see the impact that you created. And so having people knock on our door stating that, yeah, asking about that, or even just the overload response from people stating how DCN has helped them has been freaking awesome. It's just like, wow, like this, this is cool. Like, this is really cool. And, um, it, it, you know, and that's another thing too, why I know that I'm, I, I am serious about my decision is even with all this great excitement and people wanting to, you know, they're interested in it and people stating all these good things. I, I don't have that feeling of maybe I should go back. So I do know that it is time. It is time to hand it off to hopefully somebody that can move it on. Um, and for me to now move on to something else and, and grow and, and, you know, see what else I can do for the community and industry. Because you've, I appreciate that. First of all, that, that was so heartfelt on, you know, what it's like to be re Cause in, initially I think everybody would say, well, you can go back, you know what yeah. I mean? You can be an employee or I think I gave you that advice. Like you could do this or you could do that. And at the end of the day, it's really important that you, f you go with what you're feeling. I mean, I, I can't disagree with those activities because that's how I am. I, I wake up every morning and if I'm not extremely stoked on what I have going on, then I just don't know if I can, I can pull that off. Did you, uh, I just want, I was lurking your Facebook and I hope I'm not off, but did you go to Meadowlands? I did, yeah. I did, and that's actually where I had a – I'll say what it was. I had, like, a, a full-on <laughs> breakdown, an emotional breakdown in my tent at night crying, <laughs> straight up. Like, I um, – so another transparency. Um, my fiancé is the founder of Event High. Uh, so with that, I went to Meadowlands to help him. 
um, with, they were uh, helping with check-in. And so they were working long day, long hours. Uh, we got there Wednesday. We did a 10 hour drive all the way up there, went to work the next day, all day helping with like just logistics and everything. And we were doing that all the way up until Sunday, Saturday, I was just off like everything that night. I, I just like, like I said, I lost it. Like, I don't know what it was. I don't, I just started crying. And like, I was like, I'm, like I said, I, I was just like, I'm done, I'm done. And, you know, I didn't really know what I meant by that. I thought I was just completely exhausted of, I don't want to work anymore. Like I want to just sleep, like I'm done. Um, but then that drive home, that 10 hour drive back home on Sunday, like it was just sitting there and I could feel it. I could see it when looking at myself in the mirror, I could feel it in my body. Like I was just like, no, like I, done like I, I don't have it anymore I can't continue this this fight I can't continue these you know um, 24 7, not 24 7 but long days and and every day and working all these side jobs to to continue to move DCN I just I can't do this to myself anymore um so, so yeah, that was my Meadowlands. <laughs> Everybody else had a great time. <laughs> you did. I mean, there had to have been. So I saw lots of pictures. Like Frenchie Cannoli was there. Like there were some heads there for sure. That's yeah. interesting that you had your epiphany. Maybe because you got into nature and kind of started feeling that energy, where you you decided like this is just, you know, people always assume when you have your own business that you don't get tired of it. Um, yeah. but I have done that. I've, you know, I walked away from a business I did for quite some time just because I just wasn't feeling it anymore. And you try to explain that to people and they're just like, what? I don't get it. Like I thought you started it cause that's what you wanted to do. You're like, I did, but now I want to yeah. do something different. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I j you just posted something, which I wanted to talk with you before we got on and, and started this podcast, but it's just going to come out now. You know, you, your recent post that you just did two hours ago about, people charging founders to pitch it's a huge deal in the space like mm -hmm. people take percentage of your business they take a percentage of the raise they charge you fees plus take a percentage of your raise plus take a percentage of your business speak a little bit to that because you were pretty true blue and like trying to figure out how to monetize without being one of those types of companies like what about that caused you to stay on the other side of it what what is wrong with it in your eyes um you know i just think it's just not a it, it, it gives an unfair advantage to people that don't have money and and i know what that's like building a company with with little you know luckily i was able to raise some capital along the way but beforehand and, and even after that capital um you know we, we were still a bootstrap company um so it gives, gives an unfair advantage and two like i look at it this way i'm like investors have money Startups don't have money. And if I was an investor or when I become an investor, that's what I should say. Cause there that's you go. down my future path. <laughs> um, I don't want to see a startup spending 5,000, 10,000. I mean, even a couple hundred to come and pitch to get in front of me. You know, I don't think that's a, the right spending of money. Like they should. <laughs> and, and two, like we, they, we need, or invest, sorry, not we, I'm already speaking like I'm an investor. Investors need There you startups. go, though. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> investors need startups just as much as startups need them. You know, it goes full circle and there should be no, no money uh, to, to get me to get in front of an, an investor. I don't know. I just don't think it's, it, it doesn't make sense to me. I know it happens a lot. I know it happens not just in cannabis. Um, and if you look at it too, you know, I, I, the, it was an article that I shared. She, the, the writer even stated she's never invested in a company that's paid to get in front of her, you know, and it, you do, you're on a short amount of time. You got to try to win them over and hopefully that even gets them another meeting. Um, but you know, it, they're, investors are looking at the company and looking at the team. And I don't really think you're going to get that in that quick little 10 minute presentation that you paid for to get in front of them. Um, so I don't know. I've just never been a big believer in that. The same thing with our business model, as, as you mentioned, you know, we had, we didn't want to become a pay to play company. And uh, the reason for that too, is, you know, I wanted to be able to give a voice to who, to anybody that we saw passionate 
about the industry or about their business. You know, I didn't want it to be only people that had the check. And yes, it made it a lot harder, but I think that's what also helped create the ecosystem and build a, a trust to know that, you know, we got their back. And, and what I believe with DCN is that those companies will, will, will return that to, to the ecosystem, you know? Um, so you were definitely, uh, I mean, yeah. DCN is definitely a hub for networking, a hub for connectivity. It's one of, I mean, look, we're bombarded by social media all day long, especially mm-hmm. cannabis, social media. And I felt like you were always shooting straight and giving good articles and, you know, really trying to help people navigate, which, you know, is, it's just so, I hate to, it's kind of like cliche to be like, it's a crazy industry. What, mm-hmm. what about the industry? What surprises like did you have? I mean, I could tell you a couple of mine, but I'd like to hear what surprises that you hit in the space that you were like, this would never happen in traditional business. Um, you know, I think when I first started, it was more like people would prefer to text than to, you know, schedule, like do do it how I was used to, you know, oh, we'll have an email that will solidify the meeting or, or even it's quick text message, but people would want to have full on business discussions only through text and not get it in an email and have all these to do's. And I, you know, back then, like that was it. I'm like, no, how do you stay organized? Like I need this official, like, let's get on a call. Let's put, I'm going to send you a meeting invite. So that was the first beginning phases <laughs> was that. <laughs> um, the next was, I don't know if it was like what I didn't see in other industries, but what I learned um, was, and this doesn't even answer your question, but for some reason I want to say it, <laughs> was partnerships. You know, I, I in the very beginning, like when we were still in our pilot, I partnered with like some organizations that I I was like, oh my gosh, they're so big and, you know, they, they have a lot of in, investors and you know, I thought it would be so value, like so valuable, but they were more into us because I didn't recognize the value that we actually had at the time and, and, and have, you know, so, um, you know, there was a lot of learning lessons when it came to, to making sure we were partnering with the right people that kind of vibe and had the same mission. I know that doesn't answer your question, but for some reason, no, it actually kind of does. I mean, it's, it, it, you know, what I've, I, what I've learned is that is it is the networking thing and it is, you know, in a lot of other businesses you can, you can go sideways and then it's such big industry that it's hard for people to really hear about it. Whereas in this space, if, if you start getting squirrely, everybody seems to know about it pretty quick. Yeah. Um, yeah. W- from the time, because you started before we saw 64 come aboard for California um, to where we're at now, like, what has been the biggest aha moment? Cause we make, we all make predictions, right? Like yeah. about what this is going to like from us. It's like, what's advertising going to do is social media going to open up? Is Google going to let AdWords is they're going to be traditional print, you know? And then you kind of wait. And then when that anniversary passes, you're like, Oh, I was right. Or I was wrong. What, what were a couple hedge bets that you made thinking that you kind of knew something was going a certain direction that didn't necessarily come to fruition. And it could be like, more dispensaries, tax aid, it could be anything. Um, you know, I think it's, it's kind of like a harsher thing. Uh, I didn't realize how bad this was going to affect like the OGs, like, like straight up, like that. Like, I knew it was going to be harder. You know, I knew that we were going to have some hurdles, but I did not realize how big of a drop we were going to see in, in, in growers even in business and startup businesses, like we lost so many good companies, people that had passion, people like they just, there's no way they could survive in this, in this landscape. So that was the biggest thing, which was also heartbreaking. Um, but I knew it was coming, but like I said, I didn't know to what degree until here we are. (laughs) Um, the other thing is, um, I think we're still on the, on the right timeline when it comes to, uh, you know, all like kind of where we're at with the banking hurdles and, and all that. Um, I, I don't, I, you know, I didn't really think anything outside of that. I knew that we would still have some 
um, issues with advertising. Um, you know, for, for us, for, for both of our kind of companies, I did expect some uh, restrictions and, and requirements, um, and those seem like fine and, and able for all of us to continue to move forward. Um, the other ones, though, like I had no idea about the, like what would entail with like the packaging aspect or anything when it came to distribution and, and retail and all that stuff. Um, I don't know. You know, I, I, yeah, I, I don't really have an answer for that. I just kind of an overview of my thoughts. <laughs> what about, so I'm going to pivot. What, tell me a little bit more about Event High and uh -huh. what, why, I mean, I know partially why, but I think that doesn't make your whole decision based on, on your relationship. I think there's something there that you, that you were missing from DCN that you feel like you're filling with this new company. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that and, and like go in a little bit, a bit of detail and, and, you know, basically plug them so that people can understand, you know, who they are, what they do and where they can find them. Mm -hmm. um, well, the biggest thing that I've recognized with, with event high is that, you know, like it is needed. So the one thing that they've been different and why they are able to cater to the cannabis industry, unlike, you know, Eventbrite, uh, Ticket Bled, Splash That, all those companies is they were able to get an MRB, a marijuana related business bank account. Um, it took them a very long time to go through that process, but they wanted to be as trans like transparent when building their company. You know, they didn't want to have like a shell company and to pay you through another way. And, um, you know, they wanted to have something that was safe. Um, so it took them a lot of work and, uh, and a lot of time until they were able to officially launch the company because they wanted to find a solution and they found one. Um, so A, they actually are solving a real problem. Not that DCN wasn't, but with media, it is a little bit, you, you, gotta have, you have more years focusing on growing your users and audience and building a voice that I think that was my thing. Like I wasn't really... I, I knew we were helping, but I didn't really know what problem I was fully solving. I, I don't know if that makes sense. Like I knew we were building this ecosystem. I knew we were giving a voice, but I didn't have a clear a definition of that problem that we were solving at, at the time. And so with uh, Van High, I see the problem that they're solving. I see this community that they're bringing together. And, you know, I see that they have good intentions of trying to help event organizers move into this new landscape, you know, more specifically for California, as other states don't have um, uh, uh, laws or, or regulation yet around events. Um, so they're trying to educate their event organizers in California. And, um, and to be honest, too, I've been able to see, you know, not everything yet, but I've been able to get a peek at, you know, their quarterly updates, and they're very nice. <laughs> like, I've, I've always been telling, like, Ali on the side, like, if I had those numbers, if I was doing this, I would have been fundraising by now. I would have been out there by now, you know? Uh, and it's just because he's solving, they are solving a problem. Um, so it, it's exciting to see, and it's exciting to see that they are bringing people together, like, offline and connecting them you know, which goes hand in hand with this plant. We get, you, you go to these events and you see so many different people that don't look like you and you're connecting with them and you're, you're, this wouldn't have happened outside. You know, me in the consumer electronic industry, I was obviously, I'm obviously woman, I'm, uh, I'm Hispanic. So I was very few, I was, I was, there's very few of me in the industry. Coming into this space, there's, there's still a lot of diversity. There's so many different humans and events will continue to bring these people together, all types together to come and support this plant and connect. So there's a lot of different things that brought me to event high. Yeah. I think one of them is obviously when you, every entrepreneur, I think, including both of us goes into what we look to build with the intent to solve a problem. And then our creativity is always, how do we monetize that so we can do it for a living and not just have a hobby. It, what did it feel like when, you know, you see, you know, you're side by side, this might start a problem, but you're side by <laughs> side and you're looking over going, My, what the, how is that? <laughs> Let me, can I see something real quick? <laughs> like, how does that feel to you to kind of know that you can contribute to something DCN successful as far as I was concerned, um, monetization wise, always difficult, but you solved the problem. Um, and 
maybe, you know, shortly here we'll see it, you know, stay alive and, and maybe that new group of people will figure out, you know, the best way for them to monetize. But when you look over and you see something that like, it's truly like when I think about it on the top of my head, I'm like, there's really no other places I would probably use. And then the future proofing of that business to do it legitimately, that's when you know you got a hitter, right? And so what does that feel like? Um, <laughs> there were times where it was frustrating because, uh, you know, you see, you see the, the difference, but I also got a peek of the hurdles that they've had to overcome. And, you know, it takes a lot to build a tech company. Um, you know, they're still in public beta. Um, and so they are working 24 seven because there's always, when it comes to building to any technology, you're always fixing code or new bugs because people use your platform in so many different ways that you don't think of. So although there were many times where I'm like, gosh, like that looks so nice over there. There were other times where I'm like, oh, well, I can go easily and fix my website very quickly if it goes down. Sure. You know? <laughs> so there, there was, you know, back and forth, like I said. Um, but yeah. It, but it, now it, you're it, there. And, and how does that, mm -hmm. I mean, does it feel good to join a team too that you, that is on a success path, like that you judge by for, you know, their nice quarterly reports? That's got to be at least relieving some anxiety. It definitely does, you know, and, and I think not to say anything um, to, to put the company, uh, they're a startup. So I did see one of the areas where I'm like, oh, they, they need to connect, you know, like they need to showcase who they, like who, what their voice is, who, sure. who, not necessarily who they are as team members, but what they are doing and what they're about. That's where I saw some like lacking. And I'm like, you know, this is where I can help. You know, I could, you know, being able to build an ecosystem with DCN and give a voice, like I knew I could come in and actually highlight the good that they are doing, not just with the services that they're offering, but their mission and their why, you know? Um, so that was, that's really cool. And, and it allows me to get creative again. And it allows me to rethink things and, and to kind of just not necessarily start over, but just re utilize everything I've learned with DCN and, and help evolve this, this help evolve event high into, um, into, you know, something even bigger, uh, as it continues to move forward. That's how you get your entrepreneur degree right there. Yep. <laughs> that, that statement right there. What about, um, you said it earlier, your future, you know, you, I'm a big manifest person when, you know, my team loves me and hates me at the same time. I'll come out I'm like, we're doing this. And they're like, sure. And then at 90 times out of a hundred, it's happening. And, mm -hmm. you know, really, I do believe in the manifestation. What does the future hold for Adelia? What are you manifesting? Um, well, I will become an angel investor. I already know that. <laughs> um, hopefully sooner than later, but we'll see. Um, you know, are we also talking about like like more professionally or I'm just talking in general? in general? What what do you take away from you evolving from DCN into the new into into a new environment, and mm -hmm. how are you like building that future? for you? Like, what is it, what are your tricks? What tricks could you get or tips? I'm sorry. Should you, could you give to people that are listening that to work on their future? Um, you know, I, hmm. so as I mentioned, obviously I want to, I am going to become an angel investor. I want to become a part of a lot. Like I, I do feel that I am one of those, uh, like a serial entrepreneur, as you stated, I never thought that I would, but I can see on my journey of growing up, and how I got so bored easily and how I would always point out the wrongs and how I could fix the company. Even with no experience at the time, I was very set on they could do this and they could do that. And now I see why, because, you know, I, I have it in my blood to, be, to <laughs> become, to, to live this, this uh, crazy lifestyle of being an entrepreneur. You know, I, I, I'm hungry for trying to give feedback and, 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 and fix things and, and whatnot. Um, so I, uh, yeah, I'm personally, I, I want to really evolve in, in the cannabis community and space and, and help to continue uh, building that, that, that why and helping make sure we don't lose those voices and, you know, being there for startups and entrepreneurs. Um, 
So that is something that I'm going to continue to do. Um, I'm still actually, you know, with all these transitions, I haven't really reset my manifestations. You know, before it was all about where I'm going to push DCN, to be honest. So there's a lot of unknowns right now. But when it comes to manifestation, because I'm a true believer in that, I agree with you when you when I say something, you know, it happens. It may not happen how I envisioned it, but it does happen. <laughs> <That's true. laughs> and, and so, um, and it may not happen as quickly. You know, there is, I'm, I'm one of those people that do, I do vision boards. So that's one good thing or, or one advice or tip I would suggest. Um, you know, every year I try to do a vision board of things that I want, whether it's professionally or personally, um, and there were a couple things on my board that happened a couple years later than I envisioned. Um, I also changed the way I speak about it. You know, I don't say I wish or one day I, I use more like, um, like I am going to be, or, um, more in the sense of like, it, it's going to happen. You know, those words that, that really mean that it's, it's, it's going to happen. I don't know the correct term or not. Uh, I think, uh, if I can't, it's speaking with intent or yes. words matter, you know, yes. like it's a real simple words matter when we do, I'm going yes. to, I don't, I don't use the word try. Let's just put it that yeah. way. And I think you're that same person where you just don't, you can't use the word try. Cause the minute you say try, there's an opportunity for failure. And mm -hmm. you already know, we already know failure is an option as an entrepreneur. Yep. So yeah. I focus on not saying <laughs> the word try, even in conversation. If I start to say it, I'll stop myself and correct it. It's, it's really yep. a discipline, um, to get through all that where can, okay. So hard because usually you're kind of in the middle. Where do we want to send people to find you? Um, as we wrap up, like, what website should they go check out? You can do whatever you want here. What social media handles, you know, what do you want to leave people with as we kind of wrap this up? Yeah. Well, um, so one thing first before all that, uh, you know, the biggest thing that I do want to share with everyone too is, um, you know, nothing's wrong with closing down a, a company if you no longer have the heart and passion. Um, you know, don't give up, you know, if you're having a bad day, like really think it through. This was not a, a easy decision and it took time. Um, but you know, keep going. If you continue to have that passion and fight, this is a crazy industry that we're in. It does get lonely, tiresome. And many times you want to just cry and, you know, why is this happening kind of moments, but keep moving forward, um, build a support team. Um, and now going more into where you can find me, um, right now, the best thing would be, you know, if you're looking on social media, Twitter, Instagram, I'm at Miss Adelia, M I S S A D E L I A. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. You can connect there, Adelia Carrillo and Facebook. Um, also feel free to go check out event high. It's event high.io and yeah, those would be the the best spots right now on where to connect with me. And from there, you'll be able to follow along and just see what's happening um, on this new journey of entrepreneurship. Well, I want to say thank you. And I want to recommend that everybody go check out Event High. It's If you're doing events in the cannabis space, this is a free plug for those guys because they really are solving a problem. And the other thing is, I just want to point out that as you follow Adelia, and if there's something that you want to talk about, she's very approachable. So I'm going to go ahead and tell everybody, mm -hmm. go ahead and reach out. You might be surprised at the advice she gives you. You've been a gem. I, I so appreciate being able to do this with you. And as well, watching you continue to navigate the space, um, it's very endearing and authentic. So I just want to say thank you and thank you for giving me the chance to interview you. No, thank you. Trust me, you've been an inspiration since I've met you. So this is really cool to hear you say all these things about me, but I, I've I appreciate everything you've done and I appreciate your friendship and even being a part of the podcast today. Thanks Adelia. You have a good one. Uh -huh. You too. That's a wrap. Thank you for listening to this edition of cannabis karaoke, another kick-ass podcast about all things cannabis. You can find us on iTunes, Spotify, SoundCloud, and our website, cannabis karaoke.tv. And if you or someone, you know, would like to be on the show, please hit the book your interview button on the right. Cannabis Karaoke, grab the mic and tell your story. Wow.